This is the sixth video in a series where I cover everything you need to know to build a GPS receiver from scratch. In the previous video, we spoke about the acquisition stage that determines which satellites we can hear and the parameters that result in the strongest signals. After acquiring a satellite, we enter the tracking stage, which is the topic of this video. The tracking stage has three main goals. The first is to track the signal's parameters over time. In the previous video, I described how the receiver can observe a frequency shift in the signal's carrier wave, depending on where the satellite is in the sky. This frequency shift is one of the parameters we track. We also track the phase of the carrier wave and the phase of the PR encode. All three of these parameters are initialized with the values found during acquisition. The second goal is to decode fragments of navigation message bits. The tracking stage processes one millisecond of samples at a time. This corresponds to one repetition of the PR encode. However, the navigation message is transmitted 20 times slower than the PR encode. So that same millisecond only corresponds to 1 20th of a navigation message bit. These fragments are decoded and forwarded to the next stage, the decoding stage, where they're reassembled into whole bits. The third and final goal is to count the number of PR encodes we've observed. This is required to calculate the signal transmission time, which we'll talk about later. Usually we only observe one PR encode per millisecond, but this can change due to frequency shifts. I won't go into specifics here, but if you're interested, check out the tracker class in my GPS receiver implementation on GitHub. I've left a link in the description. So those are the goals, but how do we achieve them? Well, first we perform carrier wipe off on the one millisecond of samples to undo the effects of the carrier wave's frequency and phase shifts. Second, we use those adjusted samples to calculate a new estimate of the phase of the satellite's PR encode. As part of this, we may also increase the count of PR encodes we've observed. Third, we use the new estimate of the PR encode phase to calculate the correlation between the samples and a copy of the satellite's PR encode. From that correlation, we can decode a fragment of a navigation message bit to be forwarded to the next stage. The correlation is also used as an input to the final step of calculating new estimates for the carrier wave's frequency and phase shifts. Let's look at each of these steps in detail, starting with the carrier wipe-off. Remember from the previous two videos that when a signal is frequency shifted, its samples continually rotate in the IQ plane, and this reduces the magnitude of their correlation with an aligned PR encode. Carrier wipe-off is the process of undoing this rotation, as shown here, to increase the magnitude. In the tracking phase, as part of carrier wipe-off, we also undo the rotation caused by the carrier wave's phase. By doing this, each sample, and thus each correlation, should lie close to the I-axis. They're unlikely to lie perfectly on the axis due to noise in the signal, but if we're tracking the signal's parameters well, we should get pretty close. If we plot these correlations over time, we should see two clusters, one near the positive I-axis and one near the negative. One of these clusters corresponds to binary zeros of the navigation message, and the other binary ones. However, as we discussed in the sampling video, we don't know which is which. For example, this correlation could be a zero with a phase of 45 degrees, or a one with a phase of negative 135 degrees. Even if we don't yet know how the clusters map to zeros and ones, we can distinguish between them using the sign of each correlation's I component. However, this only works when the correlations lie close to the I-axis. If we didn't undo the rotation caused by the carrier wave's phase, the clusters would remain rotated and this technique wouldn't work. The next step of the tracking stage is to update our estimate of the satellite's PR encode phase. We do this with what's called a delay locked loop. This works by taking advantage of the fact that a better aligned PR encode will result in a correlation of greater magnitude. We start with the PR encode at our current estimate of the phase. This is called the prompt replica. From this, we generate a PR encode with a slightly earlier phase. This is called the early replica. We also generate a PR encode with a slightly later phase, the late replica. We then calculate the correlation of the early and late replicas with the one millisecond of samples after carrier wipe-off has been performed. If one correlation has a greater magnitude than the other, 
That suggests it's better aligned with the PR encode within the signal, and we should adjust our phase estimate accordingly. The amount that we change our estimate is controlled by a gain factor, which is determined experimentally. This process happens once per millisecond, allowing us to closely track the PR encode phase over time. It's also important that we update the phase to account for the carrier wave's frequency shift. The frequency shift stretches or squeezes the signal in time, so that fewer or more cycles are received per second. The PR encode is within the signal, so it's stretched or squeezed too. For example, here I've highlighted a portion of a PR encode. If a positive frequency shift was applied to this signal, the highlighted portion would occupy less time, squeezing it along the time axis. Similarly, if a negative frequency shift was applied, it would occupy more time, stretching it along the time axis. This means we'd receive slightly more or slightly less than one PR encode per millisecond, which affects the phase in the following millisecond. Thankfully, this change is proportional to the frequency shift, so it's easy to calculate. Now that we've updated the PR encode phase, we can calculate the correlation of the one millisecond of samples with our freshly aligned PR encode. This graph shows these correlations over a large number of milliseconds. As I mentioned earlier, we use the sign of a correlation's I component to distinguish between the two clusters representing binary zeros and ones. This gives us a value representing a fragment of a navigation message bit that we forward to the next stage, the decoding stage, to determine if it's a zero or a one and to be reassembled into a whole bit. To emphasize the fact that we don't yet know how these fragments map to binary zeros and ones, they're sometimes called pseudo symbols. The final step of the tracking stage is to update our estimates of the carrier wave's frequency shift and phase. We do this with what's called a phase locked loop, or more specifically, a Costas loop. This works by calculating a single value that represents the error in both estimates, and we use that value to update them. But hang on, what single value could represent the error in both estimates? Well, let's explore what happens when our estimates are wrong to see if we can find anything that would work. First, let's say our frequency shift is correct, but our phase is wrong. When we perform carrier wipe-off, we negate the rotation caused by the frequency shift, but we don't completely negate the rotation caused by the phase. This means the correlation will be rotated in the IQ plane. Maybe we could use its angle as the error for the phase estimate. And what about frequency shift? This time, when we perform carrier wipe-off, we negate the rotation caused by the phase, but not the frequency shift. This means each sample will be rotated a little from the previous, and again, the correlation will be rotated. That means we could use the angle of the correlation as the error for the frequency shift estimate too. It looks like we found our single error value. There's one last thing to consider, which is the fact that due to the changing bits of the navigation message, correlations often rotate 180 degrees. This gives us the now familiar two clusters. Our goal is for these clusters to lie on the i-axis. That is, we want the angle between each cluster and the closest branch of the i-axis, shown here as theta, to be zero. If we're not careful, however, we might accidentally use the angle between the clusters and the positive i-axis instead. If we did that, we'd be trying to rotate both clusters to the positive i-axis and they'd be fighting each other. To avoid this, we should use the a tan function to calculate the angle from the correlation's coordinates rather than a tan2. Okay, so we have our error value. How do we use it to update our estimates of the carrier wave's frequency shift and phase? Well, each estimate has an associated gain factor that determines how quickly the estimate changes in response to errors. To update an estimate, we calculate the product of the error and the associated gain factor and we subtract the result from the current estimate. Pretty straightforward. But how do we determine the values of the gain factors? Mostly by experimentation, but a good rule of thumb is that the phase gain should be around 25 times greater than the frequency shift gain. And that's it for the tracking stage.
Let's recap the important points. First, we negate the rotation of samples in the IQ plane caused by the carrier wave's frequency shift and phase through a process called carrier wipe-off. Second, we update our estimate of the satellite's PRN code phase using a delay-locked loop. This involves generating early and late replicas of the PRN code, calculating their correlation with the one millisecond of samples, comparing the magnitudes of those correlations to determine which is better aligned, and updating the estimate accordingly. Third, we use the newly updated phase to calculate the correlation of the one millisecond of samples with the PRN code. This gives us a fragment of a navigation message bit, also known as a pseudo symbol, which is forwarded to the next stage. And finally, we update our estimates of the carrier wave's frequency shift and phase using a Costas loop. This involves calculating an error value using the angle of the correlation, multiplying that value by each estimate's gain factor, and subtracting the results from the estimates. In the next video, we'll cover the fourth stage of the GPS receiver implementation, decoding. We'll learn how to group pseudo symbols into bits and to decode the information in the navigation message that we need to determine our location.